Okay, so if you turn, first of all, to Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews 2. Hebrews 2, and this word uh, captain, it's you, you, you can read the Bible, you'll see the word captain in many, many places. If you go for a concordance, something like that, look at the word captain, you'll see it lots of places. But it's only in this one particular place that it uses, uh, uses a Greek word, archagos. It's, that word is rendered differently elsewhere in the Bible. It's only here that it's rendered as captain. And it's only, only here that we have this phrase, the captain of salvation. So it's quite a unique uh, phrase that's used. And it's used only of one person, the Lord Jesus. So it's Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10. Verse 10. For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Brothers, brothers and sisters, really. Uh, so, so that's where the phrase comes from, the captain of salvation. But what does it mean? What's a, what's a captain? The word here properly means uh, author, leader, prince. And it's these three uh, sort of elements of what that word means that I'm going to be looking at this morning. I'm going to be uh, sort of delving into them and finding out you know, what... What does these words really, what's the significance of these words to us? And what does it tell us about the Lord Jesus? Firstly, it tells us that he is the author of salvation. That he is the, the procuring, to procure is to obtain something. The procuring and efficient cause. He is the one who obtains our salvation. And he obtained it for us don't need me to tell you, by the pain of his own blood. <coughs> Therefore it is fitting that the one who obtained salvation for all, but, sorry, it is fitting that the one who obtained salvation uh, for all who put their trust in him should be both the author and the captain of their Salvation. Just have a look at Hebrews 5, just a little bit further along. Hebrews 5. Hebrews 5 and verse 9. Hebrews 5 verse 9 says this. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. So, he's the author of eternal salvation to all those who obey him. And uh, we read in the Bible that Jesus Christ is going to return. Oh, thank you. Thank you. A bit of a Jesus Christ is going to return, the Bible says, in flaming fire with his mighty angels, taking vengeance on those who do not believe in God, and, listen to this, those who do not obey the gospel. So the, this idea of author, Christ being the author of salvation, is linked in with an idea of obedience to his authority. And uh, you can read that by the way, 2 Thessalonians 1, verses 7 to 8, is what I've just quoted. There. So he's the author of salvation. Is he the author of your salvation? Do you obey him? Jesus shows that obedience really is a test of love. In John 14, verse 15, we read, If you love me, keep my commandments. So we can see... That, that if we say we truly love Jesus, 
then it's going to lead us into obeying those commandments. And it's not going to be, it's not going to be like uh, uh, somebody who's under the law. It's not going to be something that we do out of a sense of duty. I must do this. You know, it's, it doesn't bring me any happiness. It doesn't bring me any joy. In fact, I find it a real burden, but I must do this because it, that's not what the Bible has in mind. The Bible has in mind that this is uh, what really causes you to rejoice is to walk in obedience to Jesus because that's what you want to do. That's the desire of your heart. And of my heart is to be obedient to Jesus. And you'll know that when you uh, uh, spend the day where you know you can look back over the day and think, I've been obedient to the Lord Jesus all day. I, I, I walked so closely to him. You know, I resisted when I'm supposed to resist temptation. And you reach the end of that joy. There, there is a joy that fills your soul that is indescribable. And I, I remember when I first became a Christian and I, I felt this, I, I thought, and I, I need to somehow write it down and stick it on my head. Because, because then, if I knew the joy that I feel now, it would keep me from sin. It would keep me from, uh, uh, from, from falling for temptation and for the wiles of the devil. You know, we need to remind ourselves what that's like. To walk in obedience to God brings joy and peace into our lives. That, that's what we were created for. And particularly as Christians, that's where our, the joy of our heart really is, is in that, is in doing His will, doing what Jesus wants to do. Because He is the captain, He is the authority of our salvation. See, the word author is where we get our word authority from. It's the, the Latin word autoritas. Uh, so the word author signifies authority, but also the founder, the, the progenitor, the maker of a thing. And yet we have this authority, this need for obedience. So the one who obtained it and the one who must be obeyed with regard to it. Just as Christ was obedient to his Father, we must take his example and walk in obedience to the author and the captain of our salvation. Just turn, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 12. All seems to be in Hebrews, because it's morning, it's just the first part here. Hebrews 12. And just right at the beginning, really. Verse 1, Hebrews 12. So the younger ones catch up. Hebrews 12. Or is it some of the older ones? <laughs> Hebrews 12, verse 1. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. So that's our example, Jesus Christ. The author of our salvation is that he was obedient to the Father. He endured the cross. He despised its shame because his eyes were fixed upon the glory that would be his. And in the same way, uh, we follow that author and finisher of our faith. Christ, the author of our salvation, he begins it in us. He carries it on and he perfects it. That's, that's part of his role as the captain of our salvation. He also leads us. He leads us. He's our leader. And uh, it's interesting, but not for the first time in the Bible, Jesus has given a sort of military style title, isn't he? And um, what's interesting about this is if you look at the Old Testament, there is a number of uh, what have been called Christophanies. Anyone heard that word before? Yeah, this is appearances of Jesus before he was actually born in Bethlehem. 
And uh, you know, this is, it gets theologians very excited about this, and they, they argue with one another about it. But we'll have a look at one of them. If you turn to Joshua chapter five in the Old Testament, Joshua five. Joshua 5 and verse 13. Joshua 5, 13. And it says this. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him and said unto him, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? And he said, Nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. Incredible. Now, a lot of people will say, well, it's an angel, isn't it? Just, just an angel come down and the appearance of him. You know, he's there, he's got his sword drawn. And he says he's the captain of the Lord's host. I don't think that really bears scrutiny. Because there's a number of things that are, are happening here when Joshua sees him. Um, the first thing is uh, uh, he questions this person. He questions the captain of the Lord's host. And when he says who he is, he says, I'm the, the captain. Uh, sorry, I'm the captain of the Lord's host is that he falls down and worships him, it says in Joshua. Now, if you compare this to Revelation 22, verse 9, where the Apostle John falls down at the feet of an angel, right? And, and I presume it's out of fear, perhaps, rather than anything else, or just awe, if an angel appeared to us here and now, I think a few of us might be finding ourselves on the floor just out of the shock of it, uh, uh, being confronted by, by an angelic being, but in Revelation 22, 9, the angel says, See thou do it not. In other words, don't do that. For I am thy fellow servant. And he goes on to say this, Worship God. So it's clear that in Revelation, when John fell down, he was worshipping. It was, it was an act of worship. Well, at least that's what the angel took it to be. And he said, you mustn't bow down before me like that. You must worship God. And yet here... Joshua falls down before the captain of the Lord's host. He doesn't say, stand up. He doesn't say, I I'm an angel, you mustn't worship me. In fact, what does he say to him? Loose thy shoe from off thy feet, because the place where you are standing is holy. Now, we, we, we are familiar with those words, aren't we? They're elsewhere in the Bible where somebody is told to take off their shoes or their sandals because the place where they are standing is holy ground. And that's where Moses speaks to the Lord from the burning bush. And, and the voice of the Lord says, take off your shoes or take off your sandals. The place where you're standing is holy ground. The presence of the person makes the ground holy. Around it's not a special place here near Jericho, a holy place where oh it's holy ground where I take my shoes off. It's the presence of the person there that it suddenly becomes a holy place. And so when this captain of the Lord's host appears and speaks to Joshua, the place has become holy, and Joshua must take his shoes off his feet. And I remember there's some oh, uh, modern worship song. That talks about taking off your shoes, you know, taking off your shoes so I can dance. And this, somebody pointed out, no, that's not why you're taking your shoes off. It's take off your shoes because you might die because you're in the presence of a holy God. You know, we need to understand that. God is holy. 